The following content is not intended to be financial advice and should not be used as a substitute for professional financial services. That hit me. Uh, you know, I had my you know, cushy corporate job and I was thinking about all the people I grew up with, the mom and pop shop owners, you know, struggling. All these people have heard about us. They love that we're black people helping out other black people. We've had to figure things out. Mm -hmm. On the plantation, they gave us the, the ham hocks and, and the chitlins, and we had, to figure, <laughs> we had to make Thanksgiving dinner off that. We've always had to figure it out. What's up, guys? It's Ross Mack, and welcome to Financial Freestyle here on Yahoo Finance. Look, whether you're a professional on Wall Street, a first-time investor, or just someone looking to change their overall financial situation, there's always a first step you got to take and look no further, because I'm speaking to some of the most influential voices in my universe and asking them about their path to economic prosperity. And my guest today is none other than my dog, Lee Moulton, founder of the Monster Fund. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. I appreciate you coming here, bro. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So to my audience, right, obviously I did my due diligence, right? Yeah. Your name ring bells mm -hmm. in certain circles, mm -hmm. probably all the circles, but just, yeah. you know, talk to the people. Who is yeah. Lee Moulton, man? Well, you know what? Lee Moulton is an immigrant child, mm. uh, born in Wisconsin, but raised by Liberian parents. Mm. And I am a doer. I'm a believer. Mm -hmm. I believe in the promise of our people. I believe that every hour, every minute I have on this earth, I should be in service, and service is something bigger than me. And for me, my choice has been helping black entrepreneurs be successful. I That's who that, I man. am. That's what I stand for. I know I started out on the street, mm -hmm. and you started out on the street, man. I so did. I would love to hear about, you know, your early days at yeah. Goldman, yes. especially working up under the CEO, Lloyd Blank. Yes, yes. Like, how was that? Especially, you know, you were there during the 08 crisis. Yes, yes. Uh, started off my career at Goldman Sachs in investment banking, and while I was there, I spent time in what they call the office of the chairman. Mm -hmm. So think about Goldman Sachs having a West Wing, right? Mm -hmm. So there's chiefs of staff that support the C-suite, and then there's people who support those chiefs of staff. Gotcha. So I was one of the folks who were in this team called the Client Strategy Group. Our job was to be a layer between the business and the C-suite and make sure we deployed the C-suite to win new business for us. Mm -hmm. And um, it was an amazing opportunity because I learned three things. I learned, number one, what leadership looks like up close. These are the masters of the universe. Back in 08, Goldman Sachs was the highest market cap bank. You had the, everyone on Wall Street wanted to go work there. So mm -hmm. you got to see excellence up, up, up close. You also had a Icarus like, like huge, huge pressure every day to be perfect, to be excellent because of the stakes. So we're working on, a, on, a, on businesses where if Lloyd doesn't close that deal, or if Gary Cohn doesn't close that deal, that can negatively impact our quarterly revenue. These were huge, huge stakes. Uh, so I got to learn how to handle pressure. Mm -hmm. The last thing was I got to learn how to collaborate. It was a team effort. Um, Goldman Sachs was like a family. Yeah. Uh, we had a diverse group of skill sets and, and focus areas that we all brought together. So uh, Goldman, I think, taught me what excellence looks like up close, mm -hmm. taught me what black excellence looked like up close, because we had some amazing, amazing African-American uh, uh, executives there. And finally, I think it <coughs> taught me that to really do this, to really be successful, you got to pay the price. Yep. You got to work the long hours. You got to do the things that are hard because on the other side of those difficulties is going to be your full potential being realized. You know, I did sales and trading, but single-handedly the greatest experience that mm -hmm. I had was they made me do one year of research. Yeah. So I had to figure out, you know, I had to do modeling to yep. actually truly understand how to value a Train company, up. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's actually talk about what you learned in investment banking that actually mm -hmm. propelled you mm -hmm. to want to start your own investment firm? Yeah, for sure. So number one thing is all these banks, these investment banks, we basically provide capital to corporations. Mm -hmm. Just like, you, you know, our moms or our dads can go to Bank of America and get a loan to buy a house and buy a car. You know, these banks, their job is to provide capital for you to go buy another company. It's the same kind of ethos, but it's all about providing capital, connecting capital with opportunity. Mm -hmm. So. I learned that motion, that core motion while I was there. So then, you know, when you take a step back, you're like, all right, this capital being deployed has to have a return mm -hmm. because for a bank to, to uh, function, it needs to turn a profit. So that's, that's fundamental in kind of how I think about investing. So I think about is the opportunity these folks are asking money for worth the return and worth the time and the return on the investment. That's what I'm thinking about. So that's the first thing. Hey, is, is this going to return for me? Is this going to be profitable? Two, 
are these the right people to execute on this? So at these banks, you have a bunch of different companies coming around saying, we want to acquire this asset. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you're not the right owner. Maybe the last five assets you acquired, you didn't integrate them the right way. Maybe you guys don't treat people the right way. Maybe you guys don't promote people the right way and that's not the right thing. So part of it is, all right, great, great um, strategy, but are you the right people to do it? Mm -hmm. And I think I bring that to investing too. Love your pitch deck, love what you're doing. I don't think you guys are the ones to do it. I want to mm -hmm. find the people who are really going to do this the right way. Um, and then the last part about it is, I think when, when we're looking at investments, it's all about what's the world going to look like when this investment matures? Mm -hmm. So you think about it, if you were an investor and you went and said, I'm going to buy BlackBerry back in two, <laughs> 2005, and you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to buy BlackBerry, that company is, is, is killing it. Well, probably would have been a really <clears throat> bad decision yeah. because the world didn't look like 2005, 10 years later. Yeah. And a BlackBerry was something that if I saw you with a BlackBerry, I'm like, you're a corny dude. Why are you, <laughs> what are you doing with your, with your BlackBerry? Get an iPhone. So you want to think about that too. Mm -hmm. Is this going to make sense 10 years from now? Is this the right decision for what the world's going to look like in the future? So those are the three things that I think Goldman taught me. And I, that's kind of what I try to bring to my ethos when I uh, deploy capital. You got to be able to look out 10 years and see exactly yes. what, you know, where the trends are going to go. Yep. And are you going to maintain a competitive advantage, right? And so exactly, yeah. let's actually talk about the Monza Fund. Mm -hmm. Like when sure. did you start it? Uh, and kind of what's the culture of it and what's the mission? Yes, <clears throat> so what happened was during the pandemic, I read a New York Times article saying that um, African-Americans were two times less likely to get a PPP loan. Mm. Um, that's because the PPP loan application was very, very complex. A lot of people filled it out the wrong way. Um, a lot of the thresholds that the PPP loans set were, mm. were just didn't really meet the criteria for a lot of African-American businesses. Mm. And I saw that a lot of them were going to fail during the pandemic, especially the brick and mortars that need mm. foot traffic to come in. So um, that hit me. Uh, you know, I had my you know, cushy corporate job and I was thinking about all the people I grew up with, the mom and pop shop owners, you know, struggling. Mm. And uh, I was like, you know what? I want to do something about this. So what I did was I went and took out my own money. Mm. And I went on Facebook and said, if you're a struggling business and you need, you know, a micro loan, $500, $1,000, let me know and I'll send it to you. We'll draw up a contract on Adobe and make it happen. Wow. I literally did that. Wow. And my inbox got flooded. And I'm talking about legitimate businesses. Wow. Um, the barbershop that I used to go to back in Chapel Hill, uh, one of my friends' dad's trucking company were mm. applying to me. Wow. And I was like, wow, this is, you know, where are the banks at? Mm. And people were talking about how, you know, they couldn't get a loan, uh, there was a credit crunch. And I th thought to myself, like, well, I can't do this on my own, but maybe if I start a fund and get other like-minded people to put their money together and pull their money together and make this legitimate, wow. we can help more people. So I called up my boy Namdi, who uh, uh, he worked at BCG and a really good friend of mine. And I was like, hey, man, you got some extra cash. I got some extra cash. Let's start this fund. Let's give out these loans to these small businesses. And when I tell you it went viral, it's crazy. We had a Yahoo Finance article, Atlanta Journal Constitution article about us. Um, we're put in the um, Chicago Small Business newsletter as one of the resources people to go to. Wow. We got flooded. I'm talking about we got maybe at, at the peak a thousand applications a day. Wow. Um, and we didn't have the capital to do that. Yeah. So with the so what we said was like, well, look, we have this huge, huge like lead generation tool. All these people have heard about us. They love that we're black people helping out other black people. Let's go find a capital partner. And we found a, a company called Foro. And okay. Foro is interesting. Foro was actually spun out of Citigroup. Okay. Citigroup had this program called Bridge, which took all the CDFIs. And for those of you who don't know what a CDFI is, it's a community development financial institution. Mm -hmm. They get federal funds to give out to folks who are in um, underserved neighborhoods and jurisdictions. So Bridge had about, um, had a network of 75 CDFIs all around the country that they syndicated um, loan applications to. And those CDFIs had millions and millions of dollars of, of money to deploy, <coughs> but weren't necessarily getting a lot of leads. So me and Nami were like, bro, we got all the applicants <laughs> coming to us. They don't even know about these CDFIs. Wow. They don't even know about Bridge. Let's partner. So we partnered with Bridge where all of our, um, we have a shared landing page where all of our applicants went to Bridge and we're getting approved for loans. Um, wow. And, and uh, it's been an amazing partnership uh, so far. 
And uh, that's kind of where it all came from. And my goal is to eventually turn the Monta Fund into a full financial services house where we're providing uh, credit cards, we're providing um, savings accounts, we're providing bank accounts, even one day providing your ability to kind of trade equities on our platform all around black empowerment, black business empowerment, making sure we are uniquely addressing the needs of black entrepreneurs. So one, let's kind of uncover this a little more. Cause mm -hmm. one, I love the mission. I love yeah. how, and it goes back to your upbringing, right? You're, yeah. You want to do for people, yes. right? And so yeah. when you got all those loan applications, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Did you say the company's name Fora? Yeah, Foro. Foro. Oh, oh, Foro. Yes. Yeah. Did they do like all the underwriting and like yeah. out of those styles and like how many people actually got funded? Yeah. So when we were doing it, we we're doing it underwriting ourselves. Yeah. Basically calling people up, <laughs> being like, are you who you say you are? We're using the Experience API to run credit checks on people. We're doing it ourselves. But now, uh, Foro, this is what they do. They're mm -hmm. connected to banking institutions. They will take you through a full on look at your taxes, all the things mm -hmm. that general commercial lenders do. They do that on the back end. So for us, we didn't have the infrastructure. We just yeah. had the demand. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I always tell people, just start. Yeah. Just start. Even if you don't have to have everything in place, there's people who have things in place. You might be providing something of service to them. And for us, we had a bunch of people who liked our platform and really thought what we were doing were cool and were wanting to work with us. Then we found a bank that had a lot of capital for them to and all the infrastructure to evaluate their loan, service their loan, and like for them to go back to, but then they need their next loan, which is really cool. That's remarkable. Yeah. Listen, people, we're gonna take a quick break, but make sure you don't go anywhere, and we'll be right back with Financial Freestyle. Welcome back here to Financial Freestyle, and I'm sitting here with none other than Lee Moulton. Man, so listen, we got this special thing yeah. that we do here called Dear Mac, right? Okay. And All right. I love it because we get a sense from the actual public, yeah. right, to understand and actually ask some of their questions, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, we got, a uh, the person that sent in a call or well, sent in a message, right? Okay. And one of the questions is, look, they understand that the success rate of venture capital investments are few and far mm -hmm. between, right? Yep. So what would you say makes for a good investment? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to venture capital, I'm going to say one thing. This is kind of deviating from your core question, but it's important. Venture capital is just another way to fund your business. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the difference between a small business loan where you have to pay it back is that venture capital is going to take equity in your business, mm. right? So I tell everyone out there who's looking to scale their business, really be thoughtful about if giving your equity and selling your equity to a venture capitalist, usually at a discount, is the only way. Mm -hmm. Explore debt options. There's really good low interest debt options where you can get that million dollars, get that two million dollars to scale your business without giving away the equity. Mm. If your business is really generating cash and is doing okay, you should be able to service those loans. It's about de-risking, but if you really believe in your business and you have a sound business model, I'm telling everyone, explore debt. Explore mm. debt right now. When it comes to, um, when I think about venture investing, the number one thing that you, know, you as a venture capitalist wanna, wanna lean into is the founder's story. Like, why is this founder working on this problem? Mm. What I like to see is I can see PhD level demonstrated commitment and knowledge about the problem you're solving. So if I'm investing in cybersecurity, I want to know you went to Carnegie Mellon and got a master's in, in, in cybersecurity. You understand the full tech stack around cybersecurity. I want to know that you've played with these problems in your head. You understand the tech. You understand what's going on. And more importantly, you understand what the buyers are trying to solve for. Mm -hmm. I think for me, that's the most important thing. I want to see that. Number two, I want to see the addressable market is growing year over year. Right. I don't want to hear about something that hasn't grown over the last two or three years or something that's declining. I don't want to bet into a slide. I want to bet into a rise. So, mm -hmm. And I want to bet into a rise that's going to be sustained over a, over a period of time. Most venture funds, you go to your LPs, you're raising, you're going to keep their money for 10 years. You're going to tell them, I'm not going to give you back your return for 10 years. Well, guess what? You want to make sure in 10 years that that bet is going to be much higher. It's not going to go up and then go down before the, uh, the return hits. Um, so I think that's really important. Is this thing go going to be growing? Is it going to be growing sustainably? I think um, the last thing I look at a venture investment is what's the price for the equity? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are coming, a founder will come in and say, hey, look, you can invest. I'll rate, you can give me 500K. I'll give you 5% of the company. You could come in and say, I don't know if I should get 25% of the company for, for, uh, for 500K, because I don't think your company's worth that much. You have to really, really think about 
what is the pricing here? Because what <coughs> some savvy founders will do is they'll bid you up. Absolutely. They'll bid you up against other investors and bid you up. You gotta be steadfast. Sometimes even if a company is the next Uber, you might not even get the right returns because you lost all your return because you paid way too much of a multiple on that investment. So what I like is I like pre-seed and seed investments mm -hmm. where you have a little bit more leverage of capital. You have less you know, cooks in the kitchen on the cap table where you can come in and say, look, I'm, I'm, I wanna get a good sizable chunk of this company for this check. And I, I wanna have the revenues and the valuation be realistic. So if I, you know, to kind of walk it back, if I'm going into a founder who's really, really, really smart, understands the problem in and out, and has demonstrated a dedication for the topic, I'm going into a large uptrend in the industry, and I get a really good price on the, on the equity, let's go, let's write the check, let's get it going, and let me support you post, uh, post check. What I love about this is just real world showing what Shark Tank does, right? Yeah. I love how you started out with saying like, look, you don't always have to give up equity, you can actually get, you know, financing, whether it's SBA loans or going to a bank. You got in, you know, into a real unicorn, yeah. right? That being Uncle Nearest, mm -hmm. right? So let's actually talk about that, yeah. you know, um, because not a lot of people get into venture capital, especially, right, at a early stage where you could mm -hmm. actually share in, you know, the true profits, like I think when we think about investing, the average person is like, oh, I wanna buy a stock, right? Mm. And sure, you get to get you know, your average 10%, but the average person isn't an accredited mm. investor, yep. meaning you make what? Uh, have a net worth of what, a half a million dollars or make at least a quarter million dollars a year, right? Um, the average person isn't getting access to those type of deals mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. So when you have a fund like this and you get an access, like how did Uncle Nearest come about? And yeah. when I call it a unicorn people, I mean the company is currently valued over a billion dollars, right? So yeah. I'm curious to understand yeah. about Uncle Nearest, what yeah. made you invest and how did that come about? Yeah, so I, I want to just clarify, I, I didn't invest through my fund into Uncle Nearest. I actually was an early advisor to Uncle Nearest way Tough. before they started. So nice. one, one of the things that I think is important is you can invest your time or your money. Mm. Uncle Nearest was investing my time. So I met Fawn and Keith back in 2015. Wow. And they were playing with the idea of Uncle Nearest. Wow. And I think one of the things that I always tell people is trust your taste in people. Mm. I think a lot of people don't realize how there is, just like there's a sommelier for wine, mm. you can be a sommelier for people. What does quality, what do mm. quality people look like? What do they, how do they, um, how do you show up in the world? And I, I think that one of the things I always noticed about Fawn and Keith were, were that they were exceptional human beings. Uh, Fawn, Fawn, of course, was a New York Times bestselling author way before Uncle Nero started. Mm. Uh, Keith was the you know, head of government affairs at Sony, huge wow. corporation, one of the most senior African-Americans at that company. So these are quality people. Mm -hmm. And when quality people focus their energy and time on something, it usually works out pretty well. When it comes to an, an investment, I think the really important thing to think about Uncle Nearest is that a lot of brands, like if you're in the consumer business, their stories don't hit. Hmm. Their stories don't hit because there has to be a why there. Hmm. I'm not going to name any celebrities' names right now, but there's a <laughs> lot of celebrities who you see, they'll put out their own liquor yeah. or their own clothing line and no one buys it. Because, yeah, they're just throwing a name on something. You, it, it, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't fit with your lifestyle. It doesn't fit yeah. with, with, with kind of like how you roll. There's not like a sense of connectivity I feel when I purchase your product to you. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't hit right. Um, I think one of the things that made Uncle Nearest and similar brands so successful is that the story that a slave taught Jack Daniel, the number one selling spirit in the world, by the way, by a wide margin, it's the wow. number one selling like, like alcohol product in the world. Mm. The fact that a slave taught him how to do that process mm. is a strong story. That's captivating. That's already gonna make you stop in your, in, your, in, your, in your shoes and be like, whoa. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, whatever. That's a strong story. Yeah. Then you layer that with the fact that his descendant is at Uncle Nearest making the whiskey the way he did it back wow. in the day with that old process. <clears throat> now you're really talking about it. And it's run by um, an all-female leadership team. Mm -hmm. And you got um, the fact that it's won every whiskey award, Best American Whiskey Award, for the last four years. Wow. So, like, you got compelling narrative. It jars you. It's an emotional response. You got relevancy. 
females in a male-dominated industry who are killing it. Mm. And it has history to it. it. You can like feel better about yourself when you consume it. It's, it's a great brand story. And then it's excellent. It wins the awards. It tastes amazing. And even if you're a whiskey connoisseur, you've had an Uncle Nearest 1856 or 1884, and you're like, this is an amazing whiskey. That's the formula. And um, I got to see that up close. And I, I'm privileged uh, to, be, to continue to be an advisor to Uncle Nearest, continue to be uh, supporting their venture fund, where they put aside $50 million to invest in other minority-owned spirit wow. brands. Um, and, and just doing everything I can to support the brand. It, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. Well, look, that's one, a remarkable mm -hmm. story, yeah. right? Being able to invest, well, I'm sorry, being able to see it from the ground yeah, yeah, level sure. and actually give them, yeah. you know, the advice and actually have some synergies mm -hmm. with helping them scale it, right? So yeah, two, yeah. you know, really quickly, like to entrepreneurs that are mm -hmm. looking, like how do you scale mm -hmm. a business? Yeah. Right. Like, I think that's the hardest thing. Right. Obviously, mm -hmm. the most most businesses are going to fail within the first five years, 10 yeah, years, yeah. et cetera. But how do you especially with your experience mm -hmm. working closely with those mm -hmm. founders? How did you see them scale and what? Yeah. Make another entrepreneur successful. So the first thing is you have to have a vision from day one. Mm -hmm. You have to walk in rooms as if you already got there because people need to believe it. People mm -hmm. need to see you and feel you and believe you have the capability and the capacity to do something grand and you have to believe that in yourself. So I think the number one thing is you have to have a grand vision because people aren't gonna invest in something small because they want a return. So I think that's number one, really believe and have a grand vision. Mm -hmm. Number two, you need capital. Wow. You need capital. Nice. And I think as African-Americans, we, we're always undercapitalized. We may need five mil, we say, okay, let me ask for one. Mm. We may need 20 mil, let me, I, can, I can figure out with five because we've had to figure things out. Mm -hmm. On the plantation, they gave us the, the ham hocks and, and the chitlins, and we had, to figure, <laughs> we had to make Thanksgiving dinner off that. We've mm -hmm. always had to figure it out. So um, I think if you have a grand vision, you have to almost have a wealth, like almost like a, a weird type of like, I want abundance. I need abundance of capital. Mm -hmm. Ask for three times more than you need, four times more than you need, because that capital is going to help you scale, because you will fail. Mm -hmm. There will be a bad product batch. There will be uh, a person you hired and gave a signing bonus to and they ended up being horrible. There will be mistakes. You cannot be on a thin capital structure where you make one mistake and now your business is done. So I think that's the number one thing. Have an abundance mindset when you come to raising capital. If you have a grand vision, you have the capital, now it's about hiring the right people, getting experts in their field. Poaching people <coughs> who have shown and been demonstrated, don't, 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 don't go hire your boy who's never done this before. <laughs> go find someone who's an expert and, and who may be at it in, in their role and be willing to take a pay cut, but take your equity because they want to come do something great. Hire experts and put them everywhere. If you do that, and pretty, pretty much now the rocket ship is, is tight, mm -hmm. it's secured, it, it's, it's, all the hatches are battened down. Now, now you can hit hyperscale. But you, you, you need the vision, you need the capital, you need the people. Special thanks to my dog, Lee Moulton. I want you guys to understand that he's doing something amazing. But more importantly, make sure you guys continue to join us here on Financial Freestyle coming out each and every Monday. Hope we yeah. gave you guys some amazing insights and inspiration for you on your own journey to creating wealth. It's your boy, Ross Mack. Make sure you come back next week and we'll continue to build wealth together. This content was not intended to be financial advice and should not be used as a substitute for professional financial services.